Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. Okay. Monday, Wednesday. See? That is how my week is going. Uh, whatever Monday you want is yours. Okay. So, again, good afternoon, everyone. Please um, bear with me. There's been a lot of news, so I have a few things at the top. So, with respect to the FAA system outage that occurred early this morning, the safety of Americans is the top priority of the President, the Department of Transportation, and the FAA. DOT and FAA report that yesterday they were working through issues in the NOTAM system, which is used to communicate key safety information about runways and flight patterns with pilots. To be clear, we're not talking about uh, air traffic control here, but we still consider it, this to be a vital uh, safety system as well. So FAA staff continued to work through the night to resolve the outage and issued a ground stop at 7.25 a.m. this morning, which lasted for approximately 90 minutes. FAA lifted the ground stop once the NOTAM system was available again, which means that the critical safety information required to resume travel was indeed available. The President was briefed this morning by Secretary Buttigieg before departing for Walter Reed with the First Lady, as you heard directly from the President on the South Lawn uh, this morning for yourselves. As we shared this morning as well, we do not have evidence that this outage was caused by a cyber attack. The FAA is working aggressively to get to the bottom of the root causes for the system outage so that it does not happen again. Bless you, Emily. Okay, so yesterday the Department of Education proposed what would be the most affordable student loan repayment in plan in history. The new plan, if implemented, will cut monthly loan payments in half for undergrad uh, borrowers. It will mean borrowers making less than about $30,000 per year will not have to pay a dime on their student loans each month, and it will reduce the time it takes for low balance borrowers to get their student loan debt forgiven. The proposal delivers on the plan President Biden announced in August to provide millions of borrowers with more affordable monthly student loan payments, giving them additional breathing room to start a family, buy a car, and purchase a home. Today we have further evidence of President Biden's economic plan delivering for American workers. QCells, a major Korean solar manufacturer, announced it will invest more than $2.5 billion to expand their plant. In, in, Delton, in Dalton, pardon me, Georgia, and to build a new plant northwest of Atlanta. This investment will create 2,500 jobs in Georgia and represent the single largest investment in solar manufacturing in, US, in the United States. In its announcement, QCells emphasized that Inflation Reduction Act was critical to making this investment possible. This builds on, on the more than $25 billion in major investments in Georgia in electric vehicle and battery manufacturing, solar manufacturing, construction materials, and more since the President took office. When the President talks about building our economy from the bottom up and middle out, this is exactly what he is delivering, more investments, more jobs, more manufacturing in America. In gun safety news, Illinois has now become the ninth state across America to pass an assault ban's weapon and take bold action to keep weapons of war off America's street. President Biden commends the leadership of Illinois' Governor J.P. Pritzker, House Speaker Chris Welk, Senate President Don Harmon, Rep Representative Bon Bob Morgan and the numerous advocates, survivors, and elected officials whose tireless efforts turned the pain of Highland Park and other facts, acts of violence uh, into meaningful action on behalf of all of the people who live in Illinois. As you've heard from me before, uh, President Biden has taken historic action to reduce gun violence, including sign signing the Bipartisan Safety Communities Act last summer. And he has continued to press for more action to keep our homes, schools, and communities safe, including federal laws requiring background checks for all gun sales and a gun and a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity 
uh, magazines. In the meantime, the president continues to urge other states to, to join, uh, California, New Jersey, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Delaware, Washington, D.C., and now Illinois uh, to ban assault weapons at the state level to save lives. And finally, a quick note on yesterday's special election in Virginia. We congratulate Aaron Roos, or Rouse for his win in Virginia's 7th District, a district previously held by a Republican. Uh, he, he made his, his campaign clear about the choice Americans uh, across the country have between extreme MAGA Republican uh, policies that would take away women's ability to make their own health care decisions and Democrats focused on expanding access to reproductive care and lowering costs for American families. It's not just in Virginia. This was, a, of course, a critical issue in the midterms elections, as many of you reported. And in their first slate of bills, House Republicans are prioritizing legislation that would amount to a national ban on abortion. It's not just tone deaf. Uh, as Republican Congresswoman Nancy May said herself, it's extreme, out of touch with the beliefs of the majority of Americans around the country. The president knows that women's ability to make their own health care decision is non-negotiable, and we will continue to fight to make that, cause, that case at the state and federal level. And one final note, on Friday, ahead of the President's trip to Atlanta this weekend, we will have a special guest in the briefing room. We'll have a, a senior advisor for public engagement, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, will be joining us, uh, will be joining me to talk about some of her work, as well as preview the significance of the President's remarks at Ebenezer Church on what would have been Martin Luther King Jr.'s 94th birthday. With all of that said, you guys can start waking up now. Um, Zeke, why don't you take us away? Um, thanks, Karine. Um, I was hoping you could try to update on uh, what the president has been doing at Walter Reed while the First Lady has been undergoing this procedure. We saw the First Lady's office put out a brief statement a couple minutes ago, but what has the president been doing? He's supposed to get the, the PDB uh, at 1 o'clock. Did that happen while he was up there? So I'll, I'll say this and be very simple. simple. Today is about uh, his wife. That is the focus for the president right now. As many of you know, the president accompanied the First Lady to Walter Reed. Uh, National Medical Center for her scheduled outpatient procedure, commonly known as Mao's surgery. Uh, the First Lady's procedure is proceeding well, and as expected, Dr. O'Connor will provide an update about her uh, her today. But again, this is about the pres this is about the president supporting his wife uh, her, uh, of 45 years. And so, uh, again, when it comes to her condition specifically, Dr. O'Connor will have more to share. But again, I, I'm not going to go beyond uh, how important it is for the president to be there uh, with his wife today. Thanks. And a couple of specific questions regarding the discovery of uh, apparently uh, documents marked classified in the president's former office. The president acknowledged yesterday that he had been briefed um, that those documents had been found. When was he briefed that those documents had been found? So let me just lay this down a little bit because it's some just for folks who happen to not be following this. Look, the president addressed this issue uh, yesterday. He addressed it on uh, um, um, uh, in Mexico City on the world stage in front of many of you at a press conference uh, with two of, of our closest neighbors, as you all know. And he said he takes classified documents and information seriously. He was surprised to learn any records had been found found there. He doesn't know what was in them. He said this, just repeating what the president had said. As soon as his lawyers realized these documents were there, they did the right thing and immediately turned them over to the archives. As he said, his team is cooperating fully with the review. And uh, we also released a statement from the White House uh, Counsel's Office, as you know, on Monday, which had, uh, which, had, um, uh, which had information, detailed information about the particular situation. As my colleagues in the Council have stated and said to all of you yesterday, this is an ongoing process under the review of the Department of Justice, so we are going to be limited on what we can say here. Uh, but uh, but as, as, as the President told you, as my colleagues have said to many of you, we are committed to doing the right thing. Uh, doing the doing this in the right way, and we will provide further uh, uh, further details uh, when it's appropriate. Karine, you mentioned you want to do this the right way. Presumably, that means the transparent way. So, my question was, when was the president briefed? He said he was briefed. When did that briefing happen? Again, I'm not going to get into details. I'm not going to get beyond what the president shared yesterday. He laid out what he knew when he knew it. 
uh, he laid out uh, how important it is. He sees it, seriously, it very seriously uh, when it comes to taking classified documents and information. Uh, I'm just not going to, I know you all are going to have a lot of questions on this, uh, but at this time I'm not going to go beyond uh, what the President said yesterday. I'm not going to go beyond what my colleagues from the White House Council uh, shared uh, with many of you uh, uh, as well on Monday. And so I'm just going to leave it there. We want to be uh, prudent here and, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, it is uh, that my colleagues really truly handle this issue. Can I have one more stab at this because again, this is uh, a lot of importance to, to people. The President mentioned that handling of classified information is important. These documents were discovered on November 2nd. This wasn't, this didn't come public until my colleague at CBS News uh, uh, reported this on Monday. Uh, that's more than two months later. Why was the public not informed while the White House pre pre prepared a PR response for two months? Again, this was under review. Uh, this is under review by the Department of Justice. I'm not going to go beyond what the President shared yesterday. I'm not going to go beyond uh, what the, my colleagues at the White House Council shared with all of you as well. Uh, look, what you, you received from the White House Council on Monday was uh, had uh, complete details, a lot of details to all of you uh, on what occurred, and just not going to get beyond that. Uh, it is, a, again, an ongoing process. We're going to respect the process. As the, pro as the President said, his team handled it the right way, uh, and uh, we're just not going to get ahead of the process from here. Thanks, Grant. Have you spoken to the President about these documents and their discovery? I have not. I have not spoken. For, well, first of all, I have not spoken to the President about any of this specifically because uh, he's laid out uh, what he knows. Uh, he has said uh, he, he doesn't know what is in them, so there's no way for me to talk about the documents if he has said he doesn't know what's in them. Um, and we're just going to allow the process to continue. So for the sake of the American public who want these questions asked and answered, would the President characterize what happened here as a mistake? Would this White House characterize this as a mistake? What I'll say is this is an ongoing process. You heard from the President. He spoke about this in detail yesterday uh, in front of, uh, on a world stage, in front of, uh, in front of many of you who were there, uh, in front of many of your colleagues. He laid out what, uh, what he knew. Uh, he said that he seriously, uh, he, he takes this seriously when it comes to classified uh, documents, when it comes to information that is classified. Uh, he was surprised to learn uh, about the records had, had been there. Uh, and uh, again, he believes that, uh, uh, that, the, um, uh, that the lawyers did the right thing and they immediately turned them over to the archives. And the President saying that he was surprised to learn about these documents, is he saying that he did not bring those documents to that office? I'm just not going to go beyond what the president said. Do we know who did bring those documents? I'm not. To the I'm office? not going to go beyond what the president said. But you're said. saying you want to be transparent, do things the right way. We're yes, not and going we, to get any more. And, we, and, and his team of lawyers did do that. They did the right thing uh, by turning over the uh, by turning over the documents to the archives. That's what they did once they realized that they had them and uh, that they were there. So it's not clear, Kareem, how the documents got from the White House to I, this office. I'm, Steve, I appreciate the question. It's under review. I'm going to let the DOJ uh, do that, do their process. I'm just not going to get ahead of it. Back on the FAA outage, has cyber totally been ruled out? Uh, right now, that is uh, what I said. We do not. Uh, this has not been viewed as a. Uh, uh, there's no evidence of a cyber attack at this point. Uh, the president has directed Department of, of, of Transportation to conduct a full investigation into the causes and provide regular updates. Uh, again. This is incredibly important, a top priority, the safety of Americans who are flying uh, every day. We want to make sure that they're safe. This is a top priority for the President, a top priority for the Department of uh, Transportation, and certainly FAA. And so uh, we want to make sure uh, that we get to the root causes so this does not happen again. Lastly, on the First Lady, when was this lesion discovered? I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to get ahead of what Dr. O'Connor is going to share later today. Uh, I, I, I stated that the procedure is going well. Uh, I'm just going to leave it there and let and let her doctors uh, speak to speak to it. On the documents case again, you've laid out that the president's lawyers and the special counsel are dealing with the legal side of this. You've now laid out that you have not had a conversation with the president about this. But this was reported Monday. It happened in November. Are you aware of any conversation in the West Wing among others, people other than the president? about disclosing this once it was discovered? What I can say is somebody, I was asked uh, by your colleague if he, if we, t we talked about the documents themselves. 
the president said he does not know what was in them, no. right? But I, but I, but also just wanted to clear that up. I look. I understand you guys are going to have a lot of questions on this. I get that. I know you guys are going to have a lot of questions on process and specifics. And what I can tell you is that I'm not going to go beyond what the president laid out. I'm not going to go beyond what my White House uh, counsel colleagues have stated. I would refer you to them for any other specifics or in additional information. I want to be prudent here. Uh, I want to make sure that and we do this in appropriate, the appropriate well, way. We're going to ask them because that's our job. And I understand, so and, and my job is to answer your so questions. Here so here we go. One Let's go. We ask this is because on like day two of this administration, yeah. when he swore all of you in, the president said, quote, I'm going to make mistakes. When I make them, I'll acknowledge them, and I'll tell you, and I'll need your help to help me correct them. So you're the one here yeah, talking to us about this. That's why we're asking you. So let's just remember that. Uh, when Ed, he was we, Ed, asked yesterday, Ed, Ed, I'm, we don't need we don't need to have this. We work very well together. We do. I don't. We don't need to have this kind of confrontation. Ask your question, and I will answer well, them the best the that reason, I can. Part of the reason we're laying that out is because you're laying out your part of the job. We're I know. Laying out our part of the job, I know, but I'm just saying question. that we don't need we to have contention. You don't need to be contentious with me here, Ed. The president was asked yesterday, but did not answer this part of the question. Why didn't he or someone in the White House inform the American people when these documents were discovered on November 2nd? Did it have anything to do, because people are asking this part of it, did it have anything to do with the fact that the election was just a few days away? Again, Ed, this is under review by the Department of Justice. It is literally under review right now. As we are, as we, as I as I am talking to you, it is under review. So I'm not going to uh, get beyond the process. I'm not going to get beyond what the president said. Look. The White House counsel, my colleagues in the White House counsel, laid out a very detailed uh, information about uh, what this particular issue on Monday. You all have that. I'm just not going to get beyond that. The Department of Justice is independent, as you know. They're they're doing a review, and I want to be prudent here. And it would be but more appropriate. It would be more appropriate for my colleagues in the White House counsel's to, to uh, office to address uh, this. Then we walk them into the briefing room and we hope they can come soon to discuss this. But there's another thing. There was nothing stopping the President of the United States from disclosing the discovery of these classified documents in his former office before it was under Justice Department review. What so I can tell you, what I can tell you right now is what the President is, is, is uh, share with you what the President said to all of you Right, which is he was surprised by this. He definitely, truly respects uh, the process here. Uh, and also, when it comes to classified, he takes classified documents very seriously. And uh, again, I'm going to leave you to the information that the president provided to all of you. And also, uh, just yesterday, in front, in front of many of you or your colleagues, and also what my White House counsel uh, a colleague shared on Monday. Of this, the leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee today, like they did after the raid at Mar-a-Lago, have asked that the Director of National Intelligence conduct a national security assessment of this yep. apparent discovery of classified information. Has the President asked for one? Or are you I, aware of I the would, ODNI? I would refer you to Department of Justice here. If this is, again, Department this is... Justice doesn't handle national security. I would refer you to Department of Justice on this particular issue that's being reviewed currently. On whether the Office of Director of National I would, Intelligence is I conducting would, a national security When it assessment. comes to the review that we are currently speaking of right now, of these classified documents, I would refer you to Department of Justice. Go ahead. Uh, apart from those classified documents, the President did say that he was unaware of of records being brought to that specific office. So aside from those, has he asked his lawyer, has he uh, looked into whether any other documents have been taken to any other uh, his, any other office that he has, whether in Wilmington or Rehoboth, has there been any kind of like audit that's been done of uh, where, where he may, where there may be others that he doesn't know about? I'm just not going to speak to this. I'm going to uh, let the process continue. It's an ongoing process, and so I'm just not going to uh, to speak to this from here. It is more prudent and more appropriate for my colleagues at the White House Council. On, on so another note, you were this. you were touting the uh, Q cells announcement uh, and the Inflection Reduction Act. Um, I just want to ask, though, you know, Governor Kemp in Georgia is also you know touting the deal and taking credit for it. Did the administration work with the Republican governor to get this project off the ground? How much help was he in this in this process? I don't have any specifics to share on uh, uh, on our conversations with the governor. 
of Georgia, but what I can share with you is what we have said many times is how important the Inflation Reduction Act is here. Uh, and we see this. We see this uh, in, in many of the announcements that we've seen across the, uh, clearly across the country when it comes to uh, making, sure that, um, uh, making sure that we're lowering costs for Americans, making sure that we're bringing manufacturing, manufacturing jobs back home. Uh, and this is part of more broadly the President's economic policy. And so we see this a lot. We see where Republicans do not support uh, some of the major critical policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, but then take credit for it, like the American Rescue Plan, but then take credit for it. But that also shows you how effective the President's economic policy has been and how it does indeed work and deliver for the American people. And so I'll just leave it there. Go ahead. The President does talk about bipartisanship. I mean, did, did, what did, did Governor Kemp help? It does. I just said I don't have anything to lay out for you, but what I'm sharing with you is what we have seen over and over again when it comes to Republicans who do not support uh, what we're trying to do on behalf of the American people. Again, the Inflation Reduction Act. Again, the American Rescue Plan, right, which is all part of the President's economic policy, which has shown uh, to have worked, which has shown uh, to actually create ten, ten million, more than 10 million jobs, which have actually helped to lower, uh, help lower in uh, cost. Uh, when you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, as we're going to move forward in implementing that. So all of these things are incredibly important. I'm just laying out to you that the President's economic policy is working. Go ahead. Um, Preen, when you were talking about the FAA, you said that the issue uh, arose as they were working through some uh, issues. And so I was wondering if you could explain a little more if basically the FAA was trying to update the system or, or was there a server issue, a database issue, if you have any more detail on how exactly you know, prior to the full investigation, this seems to have happened. So I, I would refer you to uh, the Department of Transportation. Secretary Buttigieg has been on many of, the, of uh, your colleagues' airwaves speaking about this and what occurred. He has directed uh, an after-action process to determine exactly the root causes and recommend the next steps. FAA and DOT will continue to be transparent here. Uh, about the causes of the issue and, and how we will ensure a system outage of this magnitude does not happen again. So number what, what I said earlier, which is very true, our number one focus is to make sure that the safety of Americans who are flying, right, we want to make sure that they're safe. And the second part of this is to make sure that this does not happen again. And so again, uh, there's going to be an after action process and we'll move from there. I asked about this gas stove thing that kind of bubbled up yesterday. Um, does the White House think gas stoves are, are safe? And I know that the Consumer Product Safety Commission said today that they're not looking to ban gas stoves, but I'm wondering, was there communication between the White House? So as far as the safety piece of it, it's not something for us uh, to answer from here. I would refer you to the Consumer Productive, Product, uh, Product Safety Commission. Uh, as the chair said today, and I quote, research indicates that emissions from gas stoves can be hazardous and the CPSC is looking for ways to reduce related indoor air quality hazards. But to be clear, uh, I am not looking to ban gas stoves, and the C CPSC has no, proceed has no proceedings to do so. Uh, uh, look, as far as our con uh, conversation uh, with, uh, to your question, we are in regular touch with them. But of course, they are an independent uh, uh, they are independently. They were independently correcting the record on this for several days now, and so as far as I'm aware, we're not uh, in touch with them on this particular uh, issue. Uh, again, I would uh, I would refer you to their to their comment. Quick one. Um, Russia announced today that they're replacing their military chief in Ukraine. Uh, they've installed a Kremlin loyalist there. I'm wondering if you have a reaction to this and, and what you think it says about sort of the state of the, the conflict. So look, I'm going to let the Kremlin speak to their leadership decision. Uh, but uh, as an outside observer, as we all are here, they are sh they sure have a lot of changes. Um, you know, they made a lot of changes as they uh, continue to try to overcome their own difficulties uh, in a war that they shouldn't happen in the first place. Uh, so again, I'm not going to comment for them. I'll, I'll certainly let the Kremlin speak for themselves. But again, this is a war that they started. Uh, this is a war that they created, a brutal war, and they can end it today if they choose to do so. Thank you, Karim. Uh, I have two questions for you. Last week, <coughs> President Biden said that the war in Ukraine is at a critical point, and then you repeated the statement uh, from this podium. Uh, so I'm wondering, where does this assessment come from, uh, and why the White House thinks that the war in Ukraine uh, is uh, at a critical point right now? And secondly, uh, Poland announced today plans to send a company of Leopard tanks uh, to Ukraine, 
as a part of international coalition. Does the U.S. support uh, such a coalition? Uh, and is President Biden considering sending American Abrams tanks uh, to Ukraine uh, to help, uh, especially if he thinks that the war is at a critical point? So I'll say this. Look, uh, Russia has, uh, has been attacking Ukraine for 10 months now, 10 months. And uh, this winter, we're seeing a new uh, approach by Putin targeting civilians. You've heard the president talk about that uh, specifically. It is unspeakable what the Ukrainian uh, people are enduring, and uh, and they are bravely fighting back. I'll say this to your to your second uh, question. Uh, the president has made clear uh, to uh, to President Zelensky, as you know, he was here very recently. You saw them stand side by sa side, uh, and you heard the president talk about the commitment that he uh, has for the Ukrainian people. Uh, and that the U.S. will continue to have their back, stand with Ukraine as long as it takes. And we've been very clear and consistent uh, on that. We are moving fast and, and uh, delivering uh, to support Ukraine with the tools it needs uh, to win this war. Uh, we just announced a PDA of $3 billion, uh, the largest one, just last week. And so that is going to continue. Again, we will be with them uh, as uh, as long as they need us, I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Thank you, Karine. Um, do you have a reaction from Moderna potentially increasing the, uh, the price of its COVID vaccine by 400 percent? I I don't have a I don't have a response to that. I would have to check in with the team. This is the first I'm hearing about this. And then separately, uh, do you have a reaction to Governor DeSantis a couple of days ago uh, uh, claiming to activate the National Guard? In respect of Florida National Guard in response to uh, the Cuba migration surge. So we have known uh, for some time now, right? We have seen Governor DeSantis do political stunts. Uh, that is how he how he perceives to fix uh, the uh, this issue from Florida, right? And uh, and he takes uh, you know he we're talking about people who are coming from from countries who are dealing with um, political strife, who are dealing with uh, issues uh, where they're, they're trying to find asylum, and he treats them like pawns. And so we have called that out over and over again, and we will continue to do that. Uh, and he is not dealing with the problem. He's actually creating a problem. And, uh, and so that's what I have to say to that. We've talked about Governor De DeSantis and, the, uh, again, what he, the mockery that he's making of a process that the president is trying to fix. Uh, he's trying to deal with this issue. Uh, he has made, when you think about immigration reform, a priority by putting p putting forward a piece of legislation on the first day of his administration. And what he's going to continue to call on is for Congress, uh, Republicans, uh, to uh, to actually take action and really deal with this crisis, this, this issue. Okay. Uncle Rain, a couple of questions. One, um, is there a law? showing how many times the president has been to that office uh, during, you know, his vice president, when he was vice president, et cetera. Um, is there a log showing the times that he traveled there? Traveled where? To the office, to that office. To the, the, to the, the Biden Pence. Yes, the Biden Pence, yes. You mean since he's been vice president? No. Oh, since he left as vice president? Yes. I, I do not know of, of, a such, of such a log. Nothing. Look, I, I, I'm not sure. You're just trying to see how many times he's gone to Penn, the Penn Biden Center or office. I don't, I don't have anything to share about how, how he's, I mean, at least for the last two years, right, you guys have been very aware of where he goes, right, because he has a, a protective pool that travels with him at all times. So I can only speak to the last two years when he was a, a citizen, right, uh, after becoming vice president. I cannot speak to uh, speak to uh, his movements there, where he's been, or how many times he uh, was there. As you know, he worked uh, at University of Pennsylvania, so clearly he was there uh, often. But as president, you guys are very much aware of his uh, movements and where he goes uh, and the trips that he takes uh, because he is indeed president of the United States. So I can't speak to speak to uh, after that or spoke, before that. You spoke <laughs> of the legal aspect of it. There is also a political aspect to this as well. Um, there are some Republicans who are grabbing onto this cloud of documents that have been reported. What do you believe will happen? How will the work for the American public go forth with Republicans already talking about investigations, already Marjorie Taylor has been screaming impeachment for the longest, and now with this, she's saying impeachment. How does the work of the American public move forward as now 
documents are reported that were in an office connected to Joe Biden. Again, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the pr more prudent thing to do uh, is to make sure that uh, my uh, uh, colleagues uh, are uh, de dealing with this, my colleagues in the, in the White House uh, Council office, and I want to respect the process. This is an ongoing process, as you all know, that is being reviewed by the Department of Justice, and I'm just not going to speak beyond that. I know you're talking about the policy, but I'm talking about the policy. No, I understand. I'm just not going. It, there is an ongoing process that is being reviewed by the Department of Justice. I'm just not going to speak beyond that. Atlanta trip. Can you talk about what this moment, uh, with this year being the 60th anniversary of the march on Washington, what does this King holiday mean to this president? This holiday, um, as every holiday, when we talk about uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, when we remember him on his birthday, has always a, been a critical moment for this president. You heard him talk about the reasons why he decided to run. Um, a lot of it had to do with civil rights. And, um, and he has an administration that makes sure that no one is forgotten, that there is a, that he has an administration that represents uh, the country, one of the most, the most diverse administration uh, in modern history. And that also shows a commitment uh, to uh, how he, uh, he believes to, to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s uh, legacy as well. Uh, and making sure that we walk in that legacy every day. I don't want to get ahead. He's going to be speaking, as you know, at Ebenezer Church in a couple of days. Uh, and uh, he wanted to make sure that uh, he recognized that day uh, by going there and, uh, and talking about uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, what he meant, not just to the black community, but to every community uh, just across the country, to Americans. Great. Thank you so much. President Biden campaigned on a promise to stay true to the spirit of transparency. Why then, how is it possible that the White House did not reveal the presence of these documents prior to the election when they were found? Again, the President spoke to this personally uh, yesterday. You heard him at the press conference. He laid out, uh, he laid out uh, what he knew and he talked about how important uh, and how he sees this as a serious matter when it comes to uh, classified documents and information. He talked about when, uh, about how he was surprised to learn uh, about the records uh, that were that had been found there, uh, and uh, he laid out his process and his thoughts. I'm just not going to go beyond that. Again, we released information that was very transparent, uh, meaning the, the information that you all got received from the White House Counsel's Office. And, uh, and just, I, I, I know, I, I just, I know you all are going to have a lot of questions. I get that and I understand that, but I'm not going to go uh, beyond the process that's currently happening at the DOJ. Does it undercut the president's promise of transparency that these documents were not revealed for several months after the White House discovered them? But look, you know, so when his lawyers realized that these documents were there, they turned them over to the archives. They did the right thing. They turned them over. All I can say is what the president said yesterday, I would refer to his comments. But they did the right thing by, once they learned of them, they turned it over. They turned it over to the archive, archives. Again, this That's is, the question. I understand the question, but there is an ongoing process. It's being reviewed by the Department of Justice. Just when it is appropriate for us to say more, we will. Otherwise, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. I do want to be very clear about something you said, make sure I understand you. Following up on one of my colleagues who asked you, you have not spoken to the President about this? You were, weren't you traveling with him well, when no, he I, made this public statement? No, I, the way I heard the question is, have you talked to the President about the documents? And I'm, I'm, he doesn't know what's in the documents. That's the way I heard the question, so that's the way I was answering the question. You talked to him about the revelation of these documents? Yes, we talked okay. about the CBS story, we talked about the revelation of the documents obviously, but about the documents itself, what's in them, that is something that the president doesn't even know, and I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, has he conveyed to you when he was briefed, and if not, can you go back and get that answer? I, 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 I've not talked to the president about that. What I can tell you is I know you all have a lot of questions. There is an ongoing uh, process here, and so I'm just going to let the process One more finish. Quick before. follow. I want to let you respond to former Vice President Mike Pence. Um, who talked about what he and his mother Republicans are calling a double standard with the Department of Justice. Um, Mr. Pence said, the kind of double standard that we see being practiced by the Biden administration in the wake of this incident in the Justice Department, I think is exactly what undermines public confidence in our justice system. 
again, as soon as his lawyers uh, realized these documents were there, they did the right thing and they turned over the documents to the archivist. That's what they did as soon as they realized uh, what was the documents were there. Uh, and uh, his team is cooperating uh, fully with the review. Uh, again, there's a review happening by the DOJ, uh, and we're just going to let the process move forward. I'm going to go around. I'll come back. I'll come back. Thanks, Karine. Um, just to follow up on Franco's question, given the position you're holding right now, there are no assurances you can provide at this point that there are no other classified documents out there in any other office or normal. Again, th this is an ongoing process, so I'm going to let the process uh, continue. It is being reviewed by the Department of Justice, and I'm just going to leave it there. Understood. And you referenced the, the council statement that there are limitations to what you all can say at this point in time. Do those limitations, just for clarity's sake, extend to literally everything beyond what the spe special counsel said on Monday night and what the president said last night? There's the White House counsel. My colleagues are here to answer questions on this particular issue, uh, and I am just going to let them speak to this. They put out on Monday a very, uh, a very, um, uh, you know, informative, transparent statement uh, about this particular issue. So I'm going to let them speak to the to this any f uh, further. But as for, for as for me, as for here, I'm just not going to go beyond uh, what's happening currently. And, and just one last one. The president alluded to it last night. You kind of have as well the idea of once this is kind of all over or wrapped up, there will be more information. There will be more details. Do you have a plan for that? Is there? How should we expect that additional information to come? In terms of will you detail everything you know once this is done? How, how does that all work? So as the president told all of you uh, yesterday, he, we are committed to doing the right thing here, and we'll provide further details in a pro at, at appropriate time. And that's all I can share at this time. Afghanistan, please, could you? Thanks, Green. The U.S. Travel Association says today's FAA catastrophic system failure is a clear sign that America's transportation network desperately needs significant upgrades. So what specific steps are underway to ensure that outages like this won't happen again? So the NOTAM, the NOTAM system is continuously being updated. Uh, that is something that is happening on a regular basis. Uh, as Secretary uh, Buttigieg said today, DOT is asking the FAA uh, how we improve the system to ensure it is a state of the art. Uh, every, five, every five years there is a review of the FAA authorization, and that is coming up this year. So we welcome the attention from Congress uh, to ensure the FAA has what it needs to address these issues. The FAA is working aggressively uh, to get to the bottom of the root causes of what happened uh, with the system outage uh, today and making sure, again, making sure that uh, it doesn't happen again. C clearly, the safety of Americans who are flying every day is a number one priority, uh, and what they're going to do is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. How concerning is it for the White House that there's no backup, no contingency to this system when it, when it does fail. Look, um, what you saw happen today was out of abundance of caution, uh, the action that was taken, uh, because again, the, the safety of Americans is a priority. Uh, they're going to get to the bottom of this. There's going to be an after action uh, um, document that's going to be put together. And so we will make sure that the what the president wants to see is to make sure that this does not have, occur again. Could you tap into funds from the bipartisan infrastructure law, for example, to try to make some of those upgrades that you're talking about? Well, we'll see, uh, we'll see what the after action uh, report shows. I uh, don't want to get ahead of that as far as any funding and what needs to happen next. Okay. Thank you, Kareem. First, does President Biden have confidence in Transportation Secretary Buttigieg? Yes. Why? Because Secretary Buttigieg is a, uh, is he respects uh, the secretary and the work that he has been doing. Uh, you have seen the secretary on TV. You have, heard, you have spoke, probably spoken to him uh, yourself, and they are doing everything that they can to make sure that the experience uh, that uh, Americans have uh, uh, is a good one. That's why they've held the uh, airlines uh, accountable. You've seen the, the, the secretary do that over and over again. And we understand. We understand what uh, what Americans have been going through these past couple of months. That's why the secretary has been very clear uh, on uh, making sure that they are held accountable, has put in uh, processes in place to make sure that that uh, occurs. And yes, the president has confidence in, in the secretary. And then on these documents, how could anyone be that irresponsible. It, isn't that what this president says about mishandling classified documents? The president spoke to this personally. He spoke to this personally. He, again, he believes that uh, classified documents 
and information should be taken seriously. He takes them seriously, and he was surprised it, it to learn not, by any any records. Had been. I disagree. I disagree. Here's what happened. Here's what happened once then why his. Is there a justice department? Well, let me let me explain to you the process. Here's what happened when uh, his lawyers found out that the documents were there. They immediately turned them over uh, to their archives. But they were but there. But they in the immediately them, turned them they, over to the they archives. Did the right thing I'm not going to I'm not going to go into specifics. But I'm going. I, what I'm reiterating to you is what you heard from the president yourself, Peter. Uh, which is how he saw the process and how he respects and truly uh, uh, respects and takes this very seriously and when he knew uh, and how surprised he was by it and the actions that uh, the, the right actions that the lawyers took again this is under this is under investigate is, is under review by the Department of Justice and we're going to let that process continue how can President Biden be trusted moving forward with American secrets because his lawyers his team did the right thing but he had a closet with he, classified his information lawyers in did it the right again 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 did the he did he was right surprised that the records the were there he spoke to this personally he was surprised that the that the records were there and when his lawyers found out and his team found out that they were there uh, they turned it over to their archives. And now it's being reviewed by the Department of Justice. And just one more, why didn't President Biden want to see what's really going on at the border? He did see exactly what's going on at the border. He didn't talk to any migrants, and he didn't go anywhere that people actually cross illegally. Why not? But he also, but he met, uh, he went to the, mig the Migrant Center, which was a, a critical, pl critical place to be when you think about the partners uh, who, who are uh, our partners who are helping uh, support uh, the migrants on the ground there. Uh, there happened to be no migrants at the facility at the time that he visited. But let's, but let's. Because El Paso has been crushed. The shelters are full. There are overflow migrants sleeping in the streets. And then it's just a coincidence that suddenly the president shows up and. Well, let me talk about what's going on in El Paso, right? El Paso uh, did go down significantly prior to the president's visit uh, by about 70%. And that's a good thing, Peter. That's a good thing that we, we've seen the, the numbers go down. And that is something that uh, we should be saying, OK, that's a good job there. Uh, it has helped ease pressure all across the community, but the present visit uh, uh, had nothing to do with it. Uh, and so look, again, uh, we went to, he went to a migrant center. Uh, he went to one of the busiest port of entry, which is in El Paso. Uh, and, uh, and so the president got to see. He went to the border. He got to see for himself talking to we've always been very clear that we were going to he was going to talk to the people on the ground uh, who is who who's working on the border uh, and that's what you saw you saw him meet with uh, the CBP uh, you saw him meet with partners on the ground as I just stated uh, who deal with migrants and their families and the president also is going to continue to call on uh, Congress to take action look the president has been doing the work uh, and if you think about the record funding he has done uh, he has done more than any prior re prior president to secure the border and build a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system. And that's what the president has been able to do. We've got 23,000 agents working to secure the border and we'll soon be hiring 300 more. Uh, that's what the president has uh, done here. And so uh, again, he went down there, he saw for himself, uh, and, uh, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you. One on follow up no, on. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Was there any discussion of President Biden getting a physical while he was at Walter Reed this morning, or could you provide any update on when that might happen next? Again, this is about his wife today. Uh, he wanted to. Uh, uh, he wanted to be there uh, to support her. Uh, I don't have anything else to share be besides the fact that uh, you know this, they've been married for 45 years and he wanted to be uh, there with uh, Dr. Biden during this time. And then I just have one quick question on Brazil. Has there been any discussion in the administration about if there were to be an extradition request from Brazil for Bolsonaro uh, for the events that happened this week? So I don't have an update uh, for you on this. I'm not aware of an official request for information of, or extradition uh, from the Brazilian government, the, though, of course, if we were to receive one, we treat it seriously and examine it carefully, as we generally do for, for such requests. I'm just not aware of one at this time. Good. Thank you. Um, a follow-up on the gas stoves and just a quick one on the president's op-ed today on social media. On the gas stoves question, Senate Democrats are calling for more regulations on gas stoves because they contribute to indoor air pollution. Is the president worried about the climate impact of a gas stove? 
So look, again, I, the, when it comes to the question about safety or, um, uh, or the effect of gas stove, that is not something that, the, that we can speak to here at the White House, so I would refer you to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, and, uh, you know, the President does not support uh, banning gas stoves, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is independent, uh, is not banning gas stoves. So I just want to be very clear on that. On that. Uh, and so, again, that's not, uh, that's not something that we can make from here about the safety of a gas stove. Uh, that's not something that the White House can, can provide. On the President's op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about social media, uh, he talked about reforming Section 230, but the bottom line, does the President think that social media companies should be legally responsible for what goes on on their platforms. So look, holding big big technology, uh, big tech accountable uh, has been a priority for this president since the moment since the day he took office. In July of 2021, his co competition executive order explicitly called for enforcing antitrust laws to meet the challenges posed by new industries and technologies, including the rise of the dominant inter internet platforms and addressing the surveillance of users. It is also part of his unity agenda. You heard him say last year, talk about his unity agenda, uh, and you may recall in that unity agenda, uh, he, he talked about the four areas that have traditionally been bipartisan and where the president believes we can make bipartisan progress. And in his op-ed, he urges Democrats in con and, and Republicans uh, in Congress to pass a bipartisan legislation. Look, the president, uh, again, outlined the same policy positions in this op-ed today that you saw, that you heard from him in the State of the Union last year. He said it's time to strengthen privacy protections, ban targeted advertising to children, demand tech companies stop collecting personal data on our on our children and uh, also uh, you may remember that uh, the one of the president's guests uh, well, the first lady's guest at the state of the union was uh, was francis uh, haugen uh, the Facebook wh Facebook whistleblower. So uh, this is an issue that the president is going to continue to focus on, and at this uh, and uh, is incredibly important to him. And so as the new Congress starts, uh, he's going to continue to reiterate a bipartisanship there. So when it comes to liability, does he think that social media companies need to have some skin in the game where they could be sued over what happens on so their look, platforms? When it, when it comes to section the reforming of Section 230, he calls for, he continues to call for that increasing competition reducing the impact of tech companies uh, have our, on our over our lives extends back to the campaign and he has reiterated that them as, as president so he's going to continue to do that he's going to continue to call for a bipartisan legislation as we're seeing the new Congress and that's what you're going to hear from the president and also that's why he wanted to lay out uh, uh, this uh, his thoughts with the new Congress in the op-ed. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, can I get your reaction on the new House Select Committee on China? Does the administration plan to work with them? Do you believe they will be helpful in achieving your goals in strategic competition with Beijing? And are you concerned about the potential for anti-Asian hate? So look, uh, under President Biden, we are more prepared to outcompete uh, China, protect our national security, and advance a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, than ever before. Uh, many of our efforts we have been pursuing are bipartisan, underscoring the alignment at home uh, on the key issue. We look forward to the committee getting stood up, and we'll continue to work with Democrats and Republicans in Congress uh, on this uh, on this uh, on this issue. It is a top priority as we talk about uh, you know, out competing China. And do you believe, just on the last part, do you, do you, are you concerned about the potential of the committee perpetuating any kind of anti-Asian hate? Look, that is something that we're gonna, we will always call out against. Uh, that's something that you've heard from the president and you've heard from this administration, uh, calling out any anti-Asian hate. Uh, that is not who we should be or who we are. Uh, and so, uh, again, that is a commitment that he has to the Asian community. Okay, and one more Japan, please, uh, Queen, ahead of the Prime Minister's visit, can you share the goals of this visit, particularly in terms of, you know, in the context of countering China and holding Russia accountable on its invasion of Ukraine? If you can be specific about what this visit uh, particularly means in the U.S.-Japan strategic relations. Right? So let me just more broadly, the two leaders uh, uh, are going to have an extensive and in-depth conversation over the last year at the East uh, over the last year at the East Asia Summit in Cambodia. So they're going to continue that conversation, continue that relationship, and the bilateral visit and Quad Summit in Tokyo as well. So they have uh, had um, many uh, extensive conversations. Uh, the Prime Minister will arrive at the White House after uh, consulting close
closely with us and regional partners on the release of Japan's new national security strategy and commitment to boosting uh, its defense to depend on to 2 percent of G GDP, including to invest in new defense uh, capabilities. These unprecedented, unprecedented moves will strengthen deterrence in the region in order to advance peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific and globally, as you, as, we, as you asked me about China. This meeting also comes as Japan continues to be a critical partner uh, for the United States and Europe in holding Russia accountable for its brutal war against Ukraine. Uh, the meeting uh, between the President and the Prime Minister uh, will highlight the pivotal mo movement, uh, moment we are in for the U.S.-Japan alliance and underscore how President Biden's focus on investing alliances and partnership, including Japan, is bearing fruit. And you will hear more uh, on about this meeting uh, uh, when we'll get a readout on Friday. Yes, uh, going back to transportation, TSA plans to roll out facial recognition technology at its airports nationwide, but critics have raised concerns about the racial inaccuracies, especially for Asians and African Americans, when it comes to this technology. What is the White House's response uh, to this racial disparity, and what kind of oversight can be provided to ensure that there isn't this inherent bias in this technology? So the TSA uh, continuously evaluates and, and improves upon technology and process. Uh, to better protect the traveling public and uh, ensure that screening is conducted in a uh, manner that respects the dignity of each individual. That is uh, clearly a priority. DHS is working with N NIST uh, to assess the performance of face recognition technology and reduce demographic d differentials, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, race and gender. Uh, and so that's what they're going to continue to do is evaluate, uh, evaluate and, and, and improve. I have a question of uh, putting people in, in Afghanistan today. Can you respond to that? Can I just ask if you have any information about why the president's personal attorneys were at the Penn Biden Center in the first place? Were they looking for something specific? Was there something specific they were doing going through these documents? It just seems like to send, if it was just routine moving stuff to send a personal attorney to do I, that. I would refer you to the White House Counsel's uh, very extensive um, uh, uh, kind of information on, on Monday that they provided, uh, so I refer you to that. Green, green. Uh, thanks so much. Um, on the um, a ground stop this morning, it's just such an unusual procedure. I'm wondering if you can go through in any more detail um, when the President was told that this might happen and um, you know, was he involved in that com in that decision or that conversation before it was issued, or did he learn afterwards? If you just could provide a little more detail about how that process worked. So, when it comes to the ground stop, that's something that the FAA, uh, a decision that uh, that they made, an order that they uh, uh, made. So. I, I'll, I'll send you to them. Uh, as far as the president, FAA worked on this issue, as I mentioned, as you've heard from Secretary Pete uh, throughout the night, and briefed Secretary Buttigieg, uh, and briefed Secretary Buttigieg early this morning, and then in turn, the secretary uh, then briefed the president, uh, and he spoke to to you all directly uh, shortly after. And so that has been the process on how the how the president was was briefed. The president knew before this ground stop, or if he was told immediately afterward. Uh, he was told before. And then I, uh, sort of looking back to the summit, um, that there were not major announcements on the border or fentanyl, and I'm wondering, you know, what that, what we should take that to mean in terms of the, uh, the, the success of the summit. So as it relates to uh, migration, irregular uh, migration, obviously that was a key topic of discussion, as all of you know. Uh, President Biden discussed ways our countries can continue to work. Uh, work together and to address irregular migration. So that conversation certainly happened extensively. He discussed the recent announcement of additional enforcement actions coupled with expanded pathways uh, for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. And uh, the leaders were able to agree on a number of initiatives, including a virtual platform through the Los Angeles Declaration website, which will provide migrants uh, when one unified location in which to access legal pathways they may be eligible for, as well as establishing physical centers uh, where migrants can come in in person, access uh, those legal pathways uh, as well. And so that, again, it was an extensive conversation on irregular migration. When it comes to fentanyl, uh, we've been focused uh, on taking big actions to fight drug tra traffickers and go after uh, financiers of cartels attempting to bring fentanyl 
uh, into our country. And so during his meeting with uh, uh, President Obrador, the president discussed increased cooperation to prosecute drug traffickers and dismantle criminal networks, disrupt the supply of illicit pr uh, precursors, chemicals used to make fentanyl as well, shut down drug laboratories, and prevent trafficking of drug arms and people across our shared border. So there was, there was a commitment and coordination uh, and on law enforcement training, the best practices so we can better go after criminal networks in the fentanyl trade. Uh, again, this was, uh, uh, this was a, a, a meeting, a summit that happened to our closest neighbors on how we can move forward uh, in dealing with some of the issues that are really important uh, to, uh, to, the three, uh, to the three leaders. Was it as, as ambitious as, as you had hoped? I mean, was the White House a little, you know, let down by the scope of the agreements? And can you sort of characterize, you, you know, how you're feeling at this moment about, you know, the outcome? So we believe we announced a, robu a robust uh, uh, set of initiatives on issues that are critical to North America. That's what you saw from the three leaders. You saw them yesterday in Mexico City sp answer questions, speak to uh, the different um, kind of the different issues that matter to their uh, to their country. Uh, and look, just a couple of things that includes expanding and deepening our security cooperation to combat drug trafficking, as I just laid out, redoubling efforts to address climate change by taking efforts to reduce meth methane emissions and decarbonize public transportation, strengthening and expanding North American supply chains for semiconductors and critical minerals, and providing alternatives to irregular migration by increasing ways migrants can access legal pathways to North America. Again, we believe those were a robust set of initiatives, uh, continuing uh, their close friendships uh, as we move uh, forward to, uh, uh, to uh, what's important uh, and critical to North America. Um, we were wondering, uh, there were not Republican members of Congress with the president, were they invited to come with him? Was can you sort of talk through that? Yeah. Decision? So um, I I was asked about this a couple of days ago. Look, we go through the normal process uh, as we uh, go into a, a state uh, with whether it's Republican or Democrats uh, in that state. Um, and just don't have anything further. Our Office of Legislative Affairs certainly reach out to congressional members. Our uh, Intergovernmental Affairs certainly reach, reach out to um, uh, state and local official. Uh, as you saw, the governor, Governor Abbott, uh, met with met the president at the uh, when he arrived uh, at the airport. Uh, and so again, this is a regular. We have a regular process uh, that we we uh, we uh, we go forth with every trip, and there was nothing different here. So did reach out to Republican members and, and the way that we reach out to their federal offices like we always do with, that, with every trip. And then one yeah. quick question, just following up on April's really good point, she, in her question, brought up the, the notion that, um, you know, President Biden was really former Vice President Joe Biden during the period in which these documents were found. And can you tell us how many other offices there may have been? I realize that you can't say whether they're being searched or whether there is any sort of look for documents, but how big is the scope of additional offices where the, the, at that point, former vice president was, you know, doing work. Look, this is an ongoing process, and I'm just going to be prudent here, and it would be more appropriate uh, for my colleagues to answer, uh, my colleagues at the White House uh, Counsel's Office to address, to, to address this. Uh, again, I want to respect the process, and so again, I would refer you to them. Okay. One, quick, uh, say one quick follow on that. Um, obviously, he said he was surprised about these documents being found. Has he expressed like any other emotion in response to these? these you heard di directly from the president uh, yesterday about this particular issue. He uh, answered it in a personal way. Uh, again, I would refer you to his response and how he saw uh, the issue. I just don't have anything else to share uh, beyond what the president shared with you and the American people yesterday. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank.